Mm -hmm. uh, our scriptures for today are Genesis 6, 11 through 22. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high all around. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your son's wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. And on John 5, verse 36, I have testimony weightier than that of John for the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I am doing, testify that the Father has sent me. And from Acts 20, 22 through 24. And now compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. Acts 20, 22 through 24 continued. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. There is no need for me to write to you about this service to the Lord's people, for I know your eagerness to help, and I have been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them that since last year, you and Achaia were ready to give, and your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. But I am sending the brothers in order that our boasting about you in this matter should not prove hollow, but that you may be ready, as I said you would be. For if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to say anything about you, would be ashamed of having been so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, 
but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in that, their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Thank you, Susie. 2021, how's it going so far? Good times are here again. Things are looking up. Not much has really changed. Same old, same old. Do you sense storm clouds are gathering on the horizon? It may be another rough year. Well, no matter how you feel about it, the new year is for real. Normally at the beginning of the new year, many Americans seize the opportunity to consider a new path forward. With a new path in mind, Let's review last Sunday. Around 50 AD, the Apostle Paul started a church in Corinth. It was a huge city in Greece with two very busy harbors that received ships from the east and the west loaded with passengers and cargo. Christianity was only about 20 years old when in 56 AD, Paul wrote his first letter, and it was about a year later when he sent his second letter to this new church. Last Sunday, we focused on 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 12, in an effort to discern value for our lives as we enter a new year. First, we focused on the giving of the Macedonian churches. Macedonia was a reference to believers in the northern churches that Paul started along with Corinth while on his second of three missionary journeys. While the giving mentioned here was clearly about money, specifically bronze or silver coins since paper money did not yet exist, still we noted that for Christians there are really three forms of giving. We are called to give of our treasure, of course, our financial means. We're also called to give our talents, both natural and learned abilities. We are equally urged to give of our time, the minutes and the hours that make up our unknown total of temporary days. While our treasure can be regained and our talents can grow and improve, our time is unique. Once time is given, it cannot be restored to us. Paul never specified the amount of their gift. Instead, he focused squarely on the qualities of their giving. Paul noted that the Macedonians gave in severe trial and extreme poverty. They gave as able, and they still found a way to go the extra mile. They also gave on their own initiative, and they did so happily. They begged to be involved. Even Paul was surprised by their generosity. And the Macedonians gave it the right way as though it were a gift directly to Jesus. Finally, they entrusted Paul and others to get the money where it was needed most. Second, we focused on Paul's counsel to the Corinthian church. Again, the apostle centered squarely on the qualities of giving. Paul encouraged Corinth to excel in this grace of giving. Since every gift of time, talent, and treasure is ours to freely give, because God gave it to us first by grace. We are trusted to be good stewards. The apostle made it clear that he was not commanding them to give. Paul urged them to follow the example of Christ. Remember, Jesus gave up everything so that we might become rich. Jesus created the opportunity for us to be made right with God. The apostle recalled how last year they wanted to be the first and the most eager to give. Finally, the apostle recommended a new path forward 
for the new year. Paul did not suggest that they come up with something totally unique that no church had ever tried. No, his counsel simply help finish the work. So last Sunday, we were invited to look back at 2020 and discern whether there are loose ends, incomplete endeavors, or goals that were put on hold or slowed down by the virus. These things could be health-related, financial, social, emotional, educational, relational, or spiritual in nature. There really is no limit. The new year gives all of us the opportunity to finish the work. Today, we will center on 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and strive to answer this question. Why should we finish the work? Permit me to offer four observations. In verses 1 through 5, as was read, Paul gave the Corinthians a courtesy heads up. Again, he affirmed their eagerness to help out. He had been boasting about it to the Macedonians for quite some time. Since Paul wanted to find them at their very best and avoid an awkward situation, he advised that a delegation of friends was going to visit soon. He understandably wanted them ready for his arrival when the gift would be formally received. In verses 6 through 15, the apostle once again focused on the qualities of giving. First, sparingly or generously. The apostle wrote, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. At least 90% of the first century world depended on agriculture. Farmers knew that if you cultivate an acre of land, then your harvest, whether a poor or a bumper crop, will only come from that one acre. Both lead to a crop, but only planting more seeds on more land will potentially lead to a larger harvest. Paul used this well-known concept to influence the quality of their giving. Sparingly, it means to play it safe, usually out of fear of the unknown. For example, perhaps the Corinthians could have given 50 drachmas. However, let's say they decided to only give 25. Now, why would they do that? The Corinthians may have been concerned about the unknown new year. In their minds, what if persecution increased? or unexpected expenses suddenly hit us. Reason suggested that it would be better to avoid getting into a bind. Perhaps we all know that reality from personal experience. Generously means to give as you are fully able without holding back, and perhaps even give a little more. The distinction between sparingly and generously is illustrated in that familiar story, Luke 21, verses 1 through 4. You remember, an offering was being received at the temple. Several wealthy folks brought forward their impressive gifts. God bless them. Then a poor widow stepped forward and gave two copper coins. You might say her two cents. Jesus did not criticize the wealthy for their gifts, but he did praise the widow. In his own words, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. The clear difference here was not really about good versus bad giving. It was really more about choosing better over good and best over better with a promise. And I'll paraphrase that promise. The more you put in, the more you get out. So finishing the work gives us the opportunity to choose to give generously and embrace the promise 
of a greater harvest. Head, heart over head. Paul wrote in verse 7, each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Long ago, I heard a preacher suggest that, quote, a lot of people may miss the kingdom of God by a mere 18 inches. It seemed like an odd statement at the time, but then he explained, that is pretty much the distance between the head and the heart. He noted that the walk of faith, that is from the moment we embrace Christ as personal Lord and Savior, to our daily decisions to follow in the path of Christ, are free will, heart, overhead decisions. Many people know about Jesus in their heads, but do they really know him within their hearts? Sometimes our brain pulls us one direction. No, but our heart urges us to go the opposite way. Yes, you've been there, done that, right? Paul advised the Corinthians that real giving is decided in your heart. The apostle taught that real giving should not be done reluctantly, which means to be unwilling, hesitant, or regretful. Nor should our giving be under compulsion. That's just another way of saying you're being forced, required, or bullied into it. As the apostle wrote back in chapter 8, verse 12, for if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. Have you ever struggled with questions like, will this action please God? Is this consistent with the word of God? Will this bring glory to God? Paul asserted, God loves a cheerful giver. Did you hear any wiggle room in his words? It sounded pretty clear and concise to me. Be assured, God loves our gifts of time, talent, and treasure that are within his perfect will and are freely given from our hearts. So finishing the work gives us also the opportunity to please God. Third, God provides. Before uprooting his family and moving to Palestine, Abraham was given a promise from God. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. Paul asserted that same principle in verses 8 through 11. And God is able to bless you abundantly, he wrote, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. In an effort to encourage the quality of the Corinthians giving, Paul noted, first, God is able to bless. Whatever is needed, God can provide. Second, God is able to bless abundantly. Whenever God provides, you can be sure it will be more than enough. And third, God is able to bless you abundantly so that you will abound. God provides so that you can be generous. The promises remind me very much of my old job. Before I entered ministry, many of you know, 
I was a printer or pressman. Daily, I clocked in and reported to my new era press. My job was to print movie tickets. The press was roughly as long as our sanctuary, three or four feet high, and only about two or three feet wide. I could print 10,000 tickets every 10 minutes. I had daily confidence that my employer would always provide whatever was needed to get the job done. That included the press, the forms, the type, the plates, the ink, the paper, the numbering machines, the perforator, the folder, the machinist if there needed to be a repair, my fellow pressman if I needed some advice, and of course, an experienced foreman who always had my back. Not once did I have to go out and find or buy my own supplies. So finishing the work gives us equally the opportunity to claim the promises that God always provides. Finally, overflowing. Almost three weeks has passed since Christmas Day. Exchanging gifts is a major part of the season because it reminds us of the greatest gift ever given. Jesus. Most of us also value gift giving because we like to watch the reaction when the receiver opens their present, especially when we're talking about the kids. We also often get to watch them enjoy or benefit from their gift. I like to refer to that moment as the overflow moment. Paul wrote about such moments to the Corinthians. Verse 12. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The apostle noted that not only are you helping believers in Jerusalem, also be assured that your kindness and generosity is overflowing. When believers in Jerusalem gather for worship, study, fellowship, and for the Lord's Supper, they're going to give thanks and praise to God for your gift. They are also lifting up sincere prayers on your behalf. What is interesting about these overflow moments is that the Corinthians will likely never, ever get to witness them. After all, they're not going to be going to Jerusalem. Paul and Titus will. They will not be present when the gift is presented. They will not see the reaction or the difference their kindness will make. It reminds me very much of our ministry to Mozambique, an African nation located on the Mideastern coast near Madagascar. We support a sister church there. We provide new wells and seeds and transportation and livestock are just some of the ways that we have helped. Like the Corinthians, 99.9% .9 of us will never travel the 8,000 miles to see our giving in action. But we still trust it's making a difference. The Apostle Paul invited the Corinthians to simply trust that their giving will lead to overflow moments. Many of them they will never see. So finishing the work leads to overflowing. Why should we finish the work? Well, I hope you've heard today these things. It gives us the opportunity to give generously and embrace the promise of a greater harvest. To please God, to claim the promise that God always provides, and for our giving 
to overflow in kingdom ways. So as always, permit me to offer the following invitations. We are invited to start a new life today. So sincerely pray, Jesus, I welcome you as my personal Lord and Savior. Amen. We can also rededicate our life to Christ this day. I invite you to pray, Lord Jesus, by your grace, welcome me again as your faithful disciple. Amen. And today, you can raise up to God any joys or concerns. If you have any questions about today's message or about the faith, feel free to contact us here at Bethel Church. We would love to offer guidance and support. Thanks to all our Facebook and YouTube friends for joining us today. And I offer this prayer. Heavenly Father, we are still in the early stages of 2021. Like the Corinthians, may we embrace Paul's urging to simply finish the work. What time, talents, and treasure could we give to tie up loose ends and to complete matters that have been put on hold or slowed down? Today, we also have four very good reasons to finish our work. Thank you for calling us to be glimmers of hope. We will reveal your love each day and encourage us. All in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless, and please join us next Sunday.